We know here in Church on the Moon, we've, uh, we've had our share of sickness. We've had our share of uh, incidents and things that have happened and memorial services that we've had to carry out. And we've watched life and death situations constantly. We have some sitting with us here today that aren't supposed to be here. You know, I've, I've mentioned this with Tammy several times. There she is. Praise God. Amen. And I got, uh, Ella was uh, speaking to me this morning that we've been praying for Rex. And if everything goes as planned, he may be able to come home as soon as the 17th of this month. Amen. Yes. Prayer works. We've been praying for him and lifting him and Ella up. And we've talked about the fact that we're going to see him sitting there very soon. And the first step is to get him home. So that's going to happen. So praise God. And we give God all the praise and the glory and the honor for that, don't we? You see, sometimes we, we give the little golf clap over that. But man, this is something we prayed for. He's God. He's capable. He's worth more than a golf clap. Amen. Amen. He's got this. So I started a two-part series last week called Why Church? Because it's a question that I've asked myself in the past. And it's a question that I've gotten from others. Why church? Why can't I just worship God from my porch where it's more comfortable because no one bothers me? Why can't I just do all my services online? Nobody rubs me the wrong way. It's just me and God. And I went into a little bit about why that just doesn't cut it. The first five things I talked about last week were why church? Number one was to hear the preaching of the word. That's important. Two was to participate in corporate worship. That means we're getting together to do this together as a family. And the third was because iron sharpens iron, which was our least favorite, at least mine. Because with people come problems. With people come relationships, and relationships have to be tended to in order to grow appropriately, don't they? I've never known an individual in my entire life that I've had a relationship with that hasn't rubbed me the wrong way once or twice. Where I haven't felt like, they shouldn't have said that or they shouldn't have done that. But iron sharpens iron. And if we just avoid, then we have big issues. Okay. The fourth was to encourage your pastor. Praise God, the most important one there is. <laughs> encourage your pastor. Encourage those that are in ministry. Within our, our uh, life groups that we're doing right now, it takes a while for those to catch on. It takes a while to find growth in those. For the people who have stepped up to run those life groups, to open up their homes, to study the curriculum, and to open up conversation, encourage them. Because they're stepping out of their comfort zone to do something for the kingdom. And the fifth was to exercise your gift. God has gifted you. God has put something within you, your personality, the way you're, you're good at something in particular that he has designed you for. But if you don't come around other people and you're not uh, prayed for and you're not challenged and you're not put in those situations where iron sharpens iron, you don't have the opportunity to exercise your gift to anybody, but possibly your dog who sits on your porch with you. It's truth. You've got to come to church. Now you're, you're hearing this from somebody who spent a lot of time trying to find his way anywhere but church. Has anybody ever heard uh, this said? Oh, I don't go to church. There's nothing but hypocrites there. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh man, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard that. You know what? You're right. Yeah. So's the grocery store. So is the basketball game. So is any room you find yourself with yourself. We're human beings. But if we really want to grow like we talk about growing, if we really want to make a difference, God challenges us with church. So we're going to start with number six today. The sixth reason why church is to find godly mentors. In the church, you'll discover many people who have walked the road ahead of you. 
their wisdom, insights, and even their vulnerability to teach you from their mistakes is one way that God provides to help you grow. It really isn't the seeking of advice that plagues most people. It's the acceptance of it. We often ask so that the appearance or perception of humility is presented to all watching, thus making it less awkward for ourselves when we fail. I've told this story once before, years ago, but when I raced motorcycles, there was a there was a very large double jump, a gap that probably was close to 70 or so feet. Now a double jump, you've got to hit the first jump and you've got to clear the gap in between and land on the backside of the second, otherwise things don't work out so good for you. There'll be a catheter in your future. <laughs> I attest to this. And this track, it was a new jump and only a couple guys were doing it and I was eyeing this thing. And I'm only 14 years old at the time, but I'm eyeing this thing. I'm gonna do this. And I went to my dad and I said, Dad, what do you think? What do you think? You think I should, you think I should do this jump? Will it gain me time? He said, I don't think you should do that jump, son. I said, okay, thanks, Dad. So I go back out from the next practice session and I'm coming around knowing I'm doing that jump. <laughs> and my dad's standing right by it insurance card in hand <laughs> and I kicked that bike just as high up as I could and I was sitting on the back of that seat and I had all the momentum I could possibly get generated and I hit that jump fully committed and it came up short and it didn't feel good and as the dirt flew up from my frame digging into the second jump and I departed from my motorcycle, <laughs> airborne to finish out the last 15 or 20 or so feet. I thought to myself, I shouldn't have jumped that. Now in that particular case, I didn't break a bone, which was amazing for me. But I got to thinking about this years later. See, it wasn't the seeking of the advice. It was that I went into it knowing I wasn't gonna accept it anyway. But I needed to be able to have a conversation to somehow feel like somewhere in his body language I may have picked up, it's okay to jump this. I needed someone else to take the fall with me. But oftentimes, we seek advice just so the appearance or perception of humility is presented. We already know what we're going to do. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes but a wise man listens to advice. Psalm 145, verse four, one generation shall commend commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. In this scripture, David was looking for God's people to encourage each other in praise. An older generation can inspire a younger generation to praise by remembering God's mighty acts in the past. I challenge anyone here that's my age or below, when you speak to someone who has been walking this walk for many years, they have made the mistakes, they have walked through the valleys, God has brought them up and given them wisdom. When they tell you not to jump the jump, don't do it. They know how it feels when you come up short. Oftentimes the younger generations will begin to discount the experiences of people around us who have already walked through that. We can't do that. And a young generation may stir praise in an older generation by declaring the fresh and new things that God does. But no matter which end you represent, young or old, one thing is consistent, and that's praise. And praise means you're lifting him up. So here's what I'm saying. If you run into somebody, you say, well, this person is is 82 years old and they've been going to church for 82 years. I need to listen to what they have to say. Is what they're saying to you out of praise? And is what they're saying lifting him up and not them up? Anybody, I don't care what your age or your experience or your time in church, we need to be able to discern that is Jesus is the one being lifted up. Amen. Jesus is the one being praised. To know that that advice is sound. We don't automatically take someone's advice to the bank. 
because of the gray in their hair or in their beard. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. See, we're told to recognize and follow godly leadership in the body of Christ. Leadership shown to be legitimate by faithfulness to the word of God and by godly conduct. Paul advised Timothy along these same lines in 1 Timothy 4.16. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is an important one to me. This scripture is one of my favorites because I meditate on it often. Because oftentimes when you're, you're designing a sermon, or you're coming up with your topics, and you're, you're trying to listen to God, and God says, I want you to go this direction, and this is how I want you to deliver it. And you think to yourself, but God, if I do that, they're not going to like me today. If I do that, I may have to raise my voice to a point in my excitement that causes them to think, I'm just a big meanie. These are real things that go through my head. How loud do I speak? How close does the microphone stay? How much do I walk? How much do I talk? And I got to the point, the scripture reminds me every, team, every time, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. You know, and I've said it before, I'm never going to come up here so that I can tickle people's ears with what they want to hear. I'm never going to deliver a word that God doesn't tell me to deliver. And I'm never going to be quiet when he tells me to shout. Amen. I just won't do it. Amen. Now, there are times he, he causes me to calm down a little bit. Today's one of those days. I don't know why. And there are days when the Holy Spirit rises up in me and causes me to just want to let loose. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Because this is God's church, not mine. Amen. Amen. And I want you to know I listen. I ask. And I persist. Timothy was examining in the scripture constantly the two great areas of concern. One's life and one's doctrine. He knew that failing to do this would mean peril for both himself and and for those in his congregation. See, Timothy is in a spot where he may, be, he may be becoming subject to some comments or subject to some things or direction people may want him to go, but he needs to constantly be in communication with his God to know and to be confident of where the word's coming from. 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Faith and a good conscience are essential when battling for the Lord. They protect against the spiritual attacks of doubt and condemnation, which will always come. Timothy had to have the faith that God was in control and would guide him as he continued to seek him. He also had to have a good conscience because his enemies would be attacking him. And if Timothy had not conducted himself correctly, they would have good reason to attack. See, a good conscience isn't just a conscience that approves us, but one that approves us because we've been doing what is right. It is connected with good conduct. It is what allows us to live in peace, even when others are busy trying to take it away. When you are confident in your pursuit of God and his will for your life, you are not subject to another's inconsistency. Amen. You can be consistent. There are times my personality, you've known me for a long time. There are times that the, the enemy begins to try to push that button to reactivate who I used to be. To get me to get in an uproar, to get me to get angry, to get me to become slanderous, to get me to begin to talk and say things that I shouldn't say. And I can feel it. I can almost feel his finger on the button sometimes. And that's where we have to come back, pastor or not. You have to come back to the fact that you review every day where you stand. 
You review every day where your truth comes from, where your facts come from, and where your attitude comes from. Because if you do not check yourself, it will be a runaway train, I promise. If I don't check myself every day, I gain momentum. And you know what happens when you gain momentum? You start going so fast, you can't get yourself stopped. And then you begin to say things like, I'm tired of this. I'm done with this. I don't want to be a pastor anymore. I don't want to preach every week. I don't want to go through what you have to go through to grow this. I don't want to do this. Why? Because the depression sets in, the weight sets in, and you begin to allow it to sit upon your shoulders. But who knows? God told us the burden was not ours. Amen. And yet we persist to pick it up. We don't want to bother God with it. We know the answer, but often we do the opposite. My encouragement to you, be consistent amidst others' inconsistency because it doesn't matter. You're on your journey. My bracelet says it right here. My journey. I remind myself constantly, I will never do everything perfect, but this is my journey because this is the journey God has put me on. This is my journey to carry out. I'm not responsible for anybody else's journey in this place. That's something you have to pick up for yourself. Amen. But the thing about a journey is you can be walking along and if there's noise over here and you stop and pay attention to someone else's, your forward momentum has ceased. It's about your journey. The seventh reason why church, to teach your kids to love the church. As youth pastors, Krista and I would see parents drop off their kids asking us to fix them. Often the parents grew up in church themselves, but at some point they walked away. And most never really had a solid relationship with Jesus. However, when their own kids were at risk, it was to the church that they returned. But they usually didn't come themselves. They would just drop their kids off in hopes that maybe some good would rub off on them. If you want to teach your kids to love God, they need to see that you love God. And if you want them to learn to love God's people, they have to observe you loving God's people. There's no shortcuts in this process. I've sat with people before that I don't know where this problem comes, with, comes from with my child. I guess it's just being a teenager, they want nothing to do with church. They want nothing to do with church people. They want nothing to do with uh, uh, these hypocrites that occupy this building. And you sit and listen to it and you think to yourself, I've seen you in church half a dozen times over the last 15 years. I've heard you disparage other people. I've heard you tear people down. I've heard you talk about church people. And they stand and wonder, what is wrong with my child? I've given them scripture. I've put it on their walls. They need to observe you loving God's people. Amen. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. A student will become like his teacher. Jesus didn't say the disciple will become as the teacher teaches him to be. Rather, he will be like his teacher. My dad always used to have a saying he used in jest, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. That doesn't cut it. Doesn't cut it, Dad. <laughs> Information was never enough to save man. It took God incarnate to save man. Amen. It took the example and sacrifice of Jesus. The scripture being written down and studied and all the things that the children of Israel went through, none of it could save man. There had to be an example. God incarnate, he had to come down himself in the form of Jesus and lay down the ultimate sacrifice. The eighth reason why church, to be a light to your community. 
Jesus said the world will know we are his disciples by our love for one another. So of course Satan wants to destroy any sense of love and community in the body of Christ. When you commit to loving God and loving others, the light shining from your Christ honoring, grab a hold of that, your Christ honoring love is what the Spirit can use to draw others to know Jesus. If your actions and words are not Christ honoring, then you will not exhibit the light that draws others to know Jesus. Because people can smell a fake. They know if you are trying to sell them a car that you wouldn't drive yourself. Do you remember Yugo's? The Russian made three cylinder car. Kind of came out, I believe it was in the late 80s, early 90s. Somebody had to sell those things, guys. Do you think anybody that worked at a Yugo dealership drove a Yugo? Unless it was given to them, you can smell a fake. You can stand in front of someone and says, yes, I absolutely, this is, you should have this car. This is a great car. This is a three-door model. This is the three-door model. Single-centered headlight. Yugo made proudly in Moscow. What color is yours? Well, I don't have one. I have a Toyota. I got to get to work, right? <laughs> People aren't going to buy a car that you don't drive yourself. <laughs> James chapter 1 verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Everyone is looking for acceptance and a place to belong. Whether people admit it or not. They long to be known and loved for who they are. When God's people commit to fiercely loving each other by covering sins with love and readily forgiving each other, their love will be a light that shines brightly in a crooked and perverse generation, in a crooked and perverse world. It's got to begin with you. That's where it's got to begin. It doesn't begin with church functions. It doesn't begin with a particular type of study. It doesn't begin with any of those things. It begins with love. Why he came. Not to have Bible studies. He came because of love. We look at a hurting world and we think if we could just get them to, to come to a, to a small group, if we could just get them to come to church, if we could just get them to hear the word of God. No. Get them to see the word of God in action. Amen. Get them to see love the thing that everyone, I don't care who you are, everyone needs to be loved. And that's why Jesus came. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that they might glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's a direct a scripture that says directly, it is upon us to let our light shine so that men might be able to glorify our Father which is in heaven. Yeah. We don't come to someone and say, glorify our Father which is in heaven. Ready, set, go. We come to them and show them the love that He has placed within us. The light that He has placed within us. The self-control that He has placed within us. Because when they begin to see those things, those are tangible things that they can put their hands on and say, something is different about that person. Yeah. And then you've introduced them <clears throat> to Jesus. And the ninth, why church? To bear each other's burdens. That sounds like a fun one, doesn't it? Life's hard. In a moment, everything can absolutely change. Just when things are going great, you get a phone call, a diagnosis, a host of other mishaps can leave you feeling afraid and alone. But those who are a part of a church family should never feel alone. Amen. When life is going great, they have an affirmation from others. And when life throws a curve, they're blessed by loving concern, support, and prayer. Let me make something clear. We are talking about genuine and not perceived concern. 
See, here's what I see happen sometimes. In my years as a Christian, I've noticed that people have two switches. One of them is, if the ER doors are open and anyone, they know of anyone in the church that is there, they are on it like that. But there's two different reasons why people walk into ERs. One is to serve self. And the other is to serve others. Because people often get wrapped up in thinking, if I can have the perception of concern here, I'm going to show up and stand in a lobby. I've done my time and I've checked it off the sheet. That that counts. But it's a matter of the heart. Are you truly concerned for who's there? Are you truly concerned? Because if you were, getting to the ER the fastest doesn't count. Getting to your knees and praying for that individual counts. They need your prayer and they need your support. I'm not telling people don't go to the ER, don't go and pray for people, but you make sure you have the right heart when you do it because if you don't, you're taking up valuable space and time because you're either going to bring God in with you or you're going to leave him outside. We have to have a heart that says, I have a genuine concern, not a perceived concern. My heart goes out to those who we've seen come to church over the years when life is hard. And then when their needs are met, they're nowhere to be found. Only to come back when there's another next disaster. This church is always happy to help them. But we know the real help they need is a genuine relationship with Jesus and his people. If you're accustomed to only going to church when you have a need... Why don't you try going when you're doing okay? Because have you ever thought of the fact that maybe God will use you to be an encouragement to someone else who is looking for help? That's what many people don't think about. Once that hurt is fixed, they don't need God anymore until the next disaster. Galatians chapter 6, verses 2 through 5. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Paul's encouraging humility here. Something you've heard me talk about many times. A proper view of self in relation to God and others. Arrogance and pride will deter people from serving others. And that behavior harms everyone. Both the community of believers and the prideful individual. If anyone thinks he is something. God has been very clear with me for many years now that the success of the church is built on the foundation of humility. Understanding that we serve an awesome God, but we are subject to that God and to his will and to when and how he moves. God puts talents and abilities within us and we are to, to find where we fit in our community, in our church, with what he's given us. But let us never forget he's God. Amen. And this is his church. And we are his people. And if we begin to try to make decisions on his behalf without hearing clearly from him, we will destroy things. Humility is what it takes every day dying to self. Every day saying, God, you are greater than anything I know and anyone I know. You are greater than myself. Thank you for what you've given me. Don't start your day out with, why have you allowed this to happen, God? Start your day off with, thank you, God, for the gifts that you've given me. Amen. If we will focus on the positive and truly give him praise for what he has provided us, for what he has done, and not focus on the trivial things. You will not give the enemy a foothold to destroy you. But it's got to be okay 
No matter what, because it's God. And He's in control. The tenth and final reason why, church, because God says so. We end on the scripture that we started this two-part series with, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together as is in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I see the day drawing near. Amen. This is a special time we live in, and there is a resurgence of the church that's beginning to happen. You can feel it. The day is drawing near. Encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. The writer of Hebrews could make, couldn't make this any more clear. God's desire to have us regularly assemble together. Realize that God wanting us to attend church is for our own good. He wants us. He wants his people to exhort one another, especially as the days grow darker and the time of Christ's return approaches. Think of the underground church in other countries. One man from China explained how that he had to sing hymns no louder than a whisper for fear they would be discovered. Discovery would mean physical abuse, their children and possessions seized, and imprisonment. Yet still they met together. China, in 2018, implemented sweeping rules on religious practices, adding more requirements for religious groups and barring unapproved organizations from engaging in any religious activity. But the campaign is not just about managing behavior. One of the goals of the government work plan was to promote Chinese Christianity between 2018 and 2022. The plan calls for retranslating and annotating the Bible to find commonalities, listen to this, to find commonalities with socialism and establish a correct understanding of the text. That's what's going on in other nations. People are under persecution. I look at my bookcase as I walked out to church today. I probably got five different Bibles in there. Nobody cares I've got those Bibles. I can walk into this building with those Bibles. I can walk around the grocery store with that Bible. I'm going to be okay. I'm not threatened with persecution or imprisonment or having my children taken away from me. But the world we live in, you could get on an airplane and be somewhere within a day that would send you to prison over it. Yeah. It's a changing world. I looked up some stories. A woman in India watches her sister is dragged off by Hindu nationalists. She still doesn't know if her sister is alive or dead. A man in North Korean prison camp is shaken awake after being beaten unconscious so that they can beat him again. A woman in Nigeria runs for her life. She escaped from Boko Haram, who kidnapped her. She is pregnant, and when she returns home, her community will reject her and her baby because she's accepted Jesus. A group of children laughing and talking as they come down to their church's sanctuary after eating together, and instantly they are killed by a bomb blast because it's Easter Sunday in Sri Lanka. These aren't made up. These are things that are happening. These people don't live in the same region or even the same continent, but they share an important characteristic. They're all Christians, and they all suffer because of their faith. In the last year, there have been over 260 million Christians living in places where they experience high levels of persecution. 2,983 Christians killed for their faith. 9,488 churches and other Christian buildings attacked and 3,711 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or imprisoned. Don't complain about the nation we live in. Amen. We live in a great place. But if we do not stand up and make our voice heard in humility and start beginning to spread Jesus and his good news and let the Holy Spirit begin to move across our nation, these things are not far off. Amen. Amen. You say, well, that seems extreme. No. It's not. Look around. It's coming. 
what we take for granted is amazing. We bought a car for Kelsey and met this gentleman who sold us the car and he, he was such a nice guy. What a great guy. And he had a, a thick accent. He reminded me, he sounded a lot like Gru of Despicable Me. <laughs> and I asked him where he was from and he says, Belarus. And I asked, how did you get to Missoula? And he said, well, it started, we got to the United States and we came to Kansas. And I thought, well, that was a good reason to come to Missoula if you're living in Kansas. <laughs> but he said he was so desperate to get to the United States of America so that he could go to church unharassed. Amen. He just wanted to be with Jesus. He wanted his family to be able to go to church. You know what he told me? He says, I don't understand. I don't understand why the church isn't full every Sunday. We get to go and no one bothers us. Right. We're not under that type of persecution. Why do Americans not go to their church? He was dumbfounded by it. He said, when, when I was a kid, I had a, a bicycle. That's all I had. He says, my kids here, they're in America. They've got cars. They've got everything they need. He goes, America, it's crazy. <laughs> but he says, the number one thing, take the cars away, take, all, take the fast food restaurants, take all these things away, take his house away. He can go to church. Amen. Doesn't that get you? Yeah. How many times have I stayed home from church and there were people risking their lives just to get in? Story should stir our hearts to see the value and incredible privilege we have to meet openly together to worship God and to hear the preaching of the word. I can read any scripture I want in this building. Any scripture I want. The church is God's work and it often comes under attack by the spiritual forces of darkness. Although Jesus proclaimed that the church would ultimately be victorious, there are inevitable setbacks along the way. But despite its flaws, the church was designed by God to allow us to continue to experience his presence in a very real and powerful way. We are reminded in Hebrews 10, through 25, let us approach with a true heart in the full assurance of faith, not abandoning our meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging each other, and by so much more, as you see the day drawing near. So why church? Let's review. To hear the preaching of the word, to participate in corporate worship, because iron sharpens iron, to encourage your pastor, to exercise your gift, to find godly mentors, to teach your kids to love the church, to be a light to your community, to bear each other's burdens, and because God says so. That's why. Amen. Heavenly Father, I praise and glorify your name. Father, I ask that this word settle in, that you bring it back to, to our minds, Father that you cause us to recycle it over and over, Father God, that you cause us to dig deeper into your word, Father, to begin to understand what you truly have for us, Father. Unfortunately, so many times, the desperation for Jesus, the desperation for church only comes under severe circumstances. Let us be a church that starts realizing what we have the power that we have access to, and that we do not wait for something bad to happen, that we're, we're not reactionary, but that we take action, knowing who you are and knowing what we are capable of through you. Father, I pray that you challenge us. Challenge us, Lord God, to be more than we are to do more than we're doing, to step up and know you in a more intimate way. 
And Father, let us not listen to voices as our direction, to other people that may sway us to go one way or another. Father, let us listen to your spirit. Let us listen to your truth and let us lean fully upon that, not our own understanding. Father God, I feel we are closing in on the end. Father, I don't believe that we're going to survive too much more. I believe that your coming does draw near. Father, I also know who you are. I've read your word. I've seen you in action. I have watched your healing hand come down and touch the afflicted. And Father, I pray this morning for whoever is here that is getting bad news from a doctor right now, for whoever is here that is being told this might be the end, for whoever is here that is being told the road is coming to an end for you. The Lord wants you to know do not lean upon your understanding and do not lean upon the understanding of man. Do not lean upon the understanding of the doctors. You lean upon me. Keep your focus upon me. Keep your eyes towards me. Trust me. Have faith in me. I have created you for more than this. I have created you for a purpose and destiny. I have created you for greatness. You do not understand the things that are possible through me. Do not listen to lies. Do not listen to man. You focus upon the truth, and the truth is found in him. Focus on him. Why, church? Because we're powerful. Why, church? Because together we can change the world. And why, church? Because we want to affect lives, lives that we will spend eternity with. <laughs> Father God, I just ask, impress it upon us. Make it important to us. Put a sense of urgency behind our words. Let there be actions associated with it that begin to change and grow beyond what the enemy can touch. Satan does not want to see a unified body. Satan does not want to see commitment. Satan does not want to see church on the move grow. Satan does not want to see more lives affected for God's kingdom. But Jesus, we do. We ask that your spirit be poured out upon these people. Father, put your arms around us, pull us in, keep us safe, bring us back to this place. We open these altars for anyone that needs prayer for any reason whatsoever. And if you are here and don't know who Jesus is, please come see me. I'll tell you exactly who he is. Because we need him. Not only to navigate this life, but to be who we were designed to be. Father, I give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.